Welcome to your first session of Stepping Forwards. This is an information and education session and we will be introducing some key models of change for you to be able to understand what's going on for the drug user and for families. In today's session, we're going to look at what Family Drug Support has to offer and the services that we provide. We're going to be looking at the stages of change for the drug user. We're going to look at the stages of change for the family. And then this analogy of the tightrope walker, which will give you some idea of what the journey may look like for you as a family member. We'll also look at a letter that a parent wrote about her daughter and then this idea of letting go and what that may mean for you as family members. We have many different pieces to our jigsaw puzzle in terms of the services that we have to offer families. The first thing we have is a 24-7 support line. This is manned by a cohort of about 150 volunteers. They are trained by Family Drug Support. We give them a free weekend's training and then they sit in their homes answering the phones um, and providing a really friendly uh, listening uh, service for families who are struggling with people who are using drugs. The second thing we have to offer is we have support groups which run all over the country. Support groups are really another important element to families receiving support. This is where families can come and start to share their stories um, and begin to talk about what's going on for them. It's also a place where families can, when they start to share their stories, can um, feel comforted, uh, reduce the shame and the stigma and the isolation that they might be experiencing. We also offer two educational courses. One of them is called Stepping Stones. Stepping Stones is a 27-hour program which consists of information, interaction exercises and homework. It guides people through their journey and helps them understand what is going on both for the drug user and the family. They learn useful tips and strategies such as how to improve communication, how to keep people safe and how to set boundaries and develop self-care. Family Drug Support runs regular updates via a newsletter. We also have forums and we have a website. Stepping Forwards is this session that you're coming to today and this is an information and education course. It's where we can share and start to learn some skills together. Bridging the Divide is what Family Drug Support does in terms of bridging the gap between treatment services and families and we are there to support the families with people who are using drugs that may be in treatment services. We also provide education and information to workers in treatment services on how to engage with the family members of their clients. Family Drug Support was started by a group of bereaved parents. Providing bereavement support continues to be an essential part of our service. We have annual remembrance ceremonies to acknowledge those who have died from drugs and provide comfort to their families. We also provide bereavement counselling. And lastly, we have the volunteering, so we always encourage people who want to be volunteers to join us. Um, and we run a, an annual weekend for volunteers where they can start to um, learn and share more of their experiences. But at the centre and the focus of all our services, we have family members and carers. We're now going to have a look at Family Drug Support core principles. The first one is about harm reduction. Harm reduction works on the principle that human beings regularly involve themselves in risky activities. Over time, we have recognised these risks and have adapted strategies to reduce the dangers and minimise that harm. Examples include swimming in the ocean, living in fire risk areas, using electrical equipment, and a particularly dangerous one is driving a car on the road. We are family focused and we believe that families have knowledge and expertise and that we acknowledge the strength that families have and by doing that we can empower families 
to be able to survive this particular journey. We don't give advice. This is one of our key principles. We don't tell families what to do. We don't say you must give the drug user or the person using drugs money or food. It's about that family deciding what they feel is most comfortable and manageable for them. We talk about harnessing the collective wisdom. And this is a really empowering experience that families come across, especially when they go to courses like Stepping Stones and they become involved in a group and they learn from each other's experiences in that group. So harnessing the collective experience can be an, a valuable um, part of that family's journey. We are non-judgmental and we don't believe there are any rights or wrongs in this particular journey. I may have one mum who decides to give the person using drugs money and the other mum who decides she's not going to do that. But by the end of six months, those mums might have changed position and decided to do the opposite. It's not about what's right or wrong. It's about what feels most comfortable for you. We also try to be real and authentic about meeting people where they are in their journey and having a genuine response to where someone may be, uh, may be experiencing trauma or shock. FDS also, as an organisation, will endeavour to meet families wherever they are in their journey. So it's really important that we understand um, where a family is. Every family is unique in their experiences. Harm reduction is a national drug strategy and it's one that Family Drug Support believes in as one of their core principles. Australia was the pioneer for harm reduction policy and this is where this particular definition comes from. We're talking about the limiting of harm that is done to both individuals and the community resulting from the use of tobacco and other drugs. This is what happens when we take a harm reduction approach. And I think we should always ask the question, where is the harm when we're looking at all major treatment interventions? What are the objectives of harm reduction? They're to reduce the harm to the individual and community around any particular activity, but in this case, particularly around drugs and alcohol to reduce the prevalence of hazardous levels and patterns of drug use, and to prevent peer hazardous drug use, especially by young people. So when we're looking at a harm reduction approach, we're looking at those three particular areas. We're now going to have a look at the structure of families. Uh, and it's really important when we work with families that we understand that families can come in all different kinds of structures. So someone might have a nuclear family, we might have extended family members, blended families, single parent families, non-parental primary carers, partners and friends. Because we need to look at the way in which that person who's using drugs impacts on anybody in their lives. And essentially the message is, it's anyone who cares for that person. We're now going to look at the stages of change for the drug user or the person using drugs. And this will give you a really good idea of where that person is in their using cycle. It'll help you to plan coping strategies uh, and to manage your expectations around their particular journey. This cycle uh, was developed in 1986 by Prochaska and De Clemente, and it is a universal model used in most medical situations. The first stage is the happy user, and when the person using drugs is in the happy user stage, they really don't have any issues with their drug use. They don't see that they've got any problems, and they can use as much as they like. However, there comes a point where that person might start feeling like they do have issues with their drug use, and that's when they move into the second stage. The second stage is called ambivalence, where they're in two minds. This is a really important stage. It's where someone's beginning to struggle with their drug use. 
They have issues. They love it, but they hate it. They want to give up, but they don't know how to. And it's really important as a family member that we can understand what it feels like for someone to be struggling with wanting to give up. One of the things that we could learn how to do is we could learn to talk to them in a non-judgmental way or give them a chance to explore why they like that drug and why they don't like that drug so that they can then come to a decision themselves. This is such an important stage. It's called the heart of change. You cannot rush the stage. However, there'll come a point where that person decides to really make a change. Making the decision to change will depend on the individual, their life circumstances, and it will be a gradual process. In our experience, most of the motivation for change comes from positive thinking rather than by being scared into it by negative consequences. They might start to think about the benefits of going to university or developing a more healthy, loving relationship. They then have to consider which particular treatment might work for them. Often people will start treatment and then change to another treatment until they find the one that feels right for them. And as a family member, we can then be there to support them and to find out what their decision is. Are they able, are they ready to really commit to making that change? We can listen to them and find out if they need any support. Once they've made a decision, it's important as a family member that we support them in their action, but don't actually rush them to detox and make the interviews for them. Let them make their own decisions. Why is it important for someone to make their own decisions? Because it will empower them in terms of their changes. So as a family member, we can really be there for them and help them round the cycle um, and give them an opportunity to um, make those decisions and um, make those appointments for themselves. Once someone has taken action, they then move into maintaining their goals. And this again is a really important stage for families to be able to understand. The most important thing usually for a family is that what you want is for your person, um, the person using drugs to be fixed and to stop using drugs. But we need to be mindful that that person can have three choices. They can abstain, they can reduce or they can control their drug use. And again, as a family member, we can start to have open and honest conversations around what the reality is for them in that particular stage. How are they going to manage their abstinence? Is uh, reduction or control another choice that they may make? So when we talk to families about their goals for the person using drugs, Almost always, that family member wants them to be drug-free. However, this may not always be the drug user's goals. They may want to be drug-free themselves, but in some instances, they may only want a reduction of drug use. Some people may want to give up some drugs, but not all, and others may want to continue using a variety of substances but have more control over what they use. It is the drug user's goals that are important and should be recognised and supported. Once someone has reached their goals or maintained their goals, that could be for a certain period of time, whatever it is they've chosen, they may lapse. A key element of the stages of change model is the acceptance that lapsing is common and most people will lapse at least once and often several times. How the family views a lapse is critical. If they see it as going back to square one and as a failure, it will have a negative impact on everyone. If it can be viewed as a hiccup and not a disaster, then everyone, including the person using drugs, will be able to see it as something that can be overcome and the person will be more able to get back on track. You can lapse from any point in the stages of change. And once you have lapsed, then you will go back 
back into the second stage, ambivalence. One thing that's really important to know as a family member is that that person will never ever go back into the happy user stage again because they've started to think differently and work differently with their behaviours. We're now going to look at the stages that a family can go through in relation to their journey. They are denial, emotion, control, and chaos. The fifth stage is one where families start to learn how to cope. In understanding these stages, a family can start to learn, or a family member can start to learn, how to cope with these stages, how to manage them, and become more physically, mentally, and emotionally stable. The first stage is the denial stage. What happens in denial is that quite often a family doesn't even know what's happening. They don't want to know what's happening because they might be too frightened. And one of the most important things is they can't believe it's happening to their family. In denial, we hear only what we want to hear. We probably don't take the signs seriously and they quite often don't have any knowledge of drugs because they don't want to accept that something might be happening to their family. The one thing that can happen though is for people to have some kind of crisis or intervention. Um, maybe the police come knocking at the door and that will help nudge them out of denial. The second stage is the emotional stage where there's lots and lots of emotions. So what is going on? For families, they're feeling very overwhelmed. They have a lot of anger, which often is masking all the other feelings underneath. The anger comes out reactive and unmanaged. There is a lot of fear, a lot of shame, a lot of guilt and blame and grief. Families do really, really grieve for a lot of things that they are losing. And it's important that we begin to understand what's going on for us emotionally in order to learn to cope with the journey. And quite often, a common experience for a family is that they will feel it's their fault, something that they did or didn't do. The third stage is the control stage. In the control stage, we have two types of control. It can be masculine or feminine, or hardline and softline. In the masculine type of control, People generally, or family members, generally seem to have very rigid opinions. It's very black and white in the way that they think about the drug user or the person using drugs. Um, and they will be issuing ultimatums such as, it's my way or no way, or if you don't stop using drugs, you have to leave home. The second kind of control, which is the feminine kind of control, is where a family member might be involved in rescuing, a lot of collusion, juggling a lot of balls, trying to keep lots of family members happy. Um, there might be poor boundaries and they may be over-involved. But it is important to note that any family member, either male or female, can have a masculine approach in the way that they um, relate to the person using drugs, or you can have a father who has a feminine approach in the way that they relate to the person using drugs. However, it's important to understand that both the masculine and feminine approaches are both controlling types of behavior. The stage four is the chaos stage, and this is where families generally are feeling hopeless, they don't know what's going on, they want to fix it, they're feeling powerless, uh, they're not sure what else is going to happen or what to do, and quite often families are running out of energy and feeling exhausted and disconnected. Also in this stage, they can start to blame other family members. And a common experience for a lot of families is that they will say, it's your fault, you've always been too hard on him, or no, it's your fault for being too soft on him. Siblings of the drug user will often be feeling resentful that their needs have been overlooked as all the attention is on the person using drugs. 
It's common for siblings to leave home at this time. Relationships and marriages can crack under the strain of all the stress. It's also common for people to repeat earlier stages, particularly denial or either type of control. The fifth stage is one where families start to learn how to cope. A family member can go through these different stages, denial, emotion, control and chaos. But if we start to build around the family and give them certain elements, that family can start to learn to cope. It's important to understand that education can help a family make better choices, build in support through support groups and also going to um, stepping stones, develop awareness and understanding of what kind of emotions and feelings and experiences the family member is going through, building in self-care is really important, learning new skills, developing and creating open and honest communication with the person using drugs, rebuilding trust, and starting to learn the skill of workable boundaries. If we build in all these elements, we may then get to experience what letting go could be like. And letting go is a process that each family member will come to in their own time when they feel most comfortable to do that. But letting go is important to understand, is letting go of our agenda and our wanting to fix that particular person who's using drugs. So if we look at the coping stage, we have denial, emotion, control and chaos. And those are the stages that the family can go through at any point in their journey. But if we start building in awareness, the support, the education, and bringing in collective wisdom, then we will find that families start to cope. That's when they're building their resilience, they're learning how to manage that particular journey, and they're developing their coping skills. That then helps a family towards success. And success is not a fixed point. It can be at any point in their particular journey. So we talk about success being whatever that may be for that particular family. Once a family does get that information and support and that collective wisdom, they do then have success and gain hope. And that means that they have strategies in place, they have access to quality support, and they start to take care of themselves emotionally, physically and spiritually. However, the caveat here is that the person using drugs may or may not be drug free. So nothing is conditional on that person becoming drug free. Once a family reaches success, wherever that is in their particular journey, they start to manage and cope. And it's important to remember that managing and coping can happen at any point in their particular journey and that their journey is a continuous growth experience. One of the most important elements of a family being able to get success or maintain success is self-care. So in the next few slides, I'm going to explain what self-care can look like and what the journey may look like for a family member. Once drug use is discovered, it can feel like you're suddenly walking on a tightrope, which is really scary and very traumatic. And quite often, a family's first instinct is that they want to get back to life as it was. This is a strange and scary place, and they may feel they're unable to move. At this point, they will often look for safety nets, anything to get off this tightrope. Safety nets include things like potential cures for drug dependency, such as naltrexone implants, or other promoted forms of treatment that offer success. Unfortunately, many families have spent large sums of money chasing these silver bullets, which deliver very little success. Families will use strategies such as persuading or threatening, etc., in order to try and get the person who's using the drugs to give up. 
If the person is a chaotic or dependent user of the substance, these efforts generally will not work. Family Drug Support does not believe in a tough love approach towards working with people who are using drugs. Once family members have discovered that the safety nets, which have promised a lot but actually delivered very little, they find that they are back at the journey and they're having to walk the tightrope again. So it might be that they go two steps forward and one step back. As time goes by, with education and awareness, families can develop skills that enable them to cope. The one thing that a tightrope walker needs in order to get across the tightrope is a balance pole. And taking hold of your balance pole is symbolic of all the self-care and the attention to your own journey that a family needs in order to find the balance in their journey. That balance pole symbolizes things like friends, hobbies, faith, counseling, work, gym, yoga, Getting education is really important. It's all those elements that a family needs to rebuild back into their lives so they can start to walk that tightrope and feel more balanced in relation to the person who's using drugs and their journey. Once our balance pole gets stronger and we're feeling more confident about walking on that tightrope, we can get to a place where we start to let go. And letting go is about letting go of wanting to fix that person and learning how to cope. I'm now going to read you a letter from a parent whose daughter had a heroin dependency. This parent has come a long way in her journey and has reached the point of letting go. For years now, my daughter has fearlessly and stupidly, in my opinion, ridden the back of a heroin addiction. The irony is that I'm a better parent for it. While she has succumbed to a dangerous, unfocused, total abandonment to this drug, I have come to completely accept her, love her, and continue to believe in her. I see her not as I would like her to be, but as she is, a person with a serious problem with drugs. There are many contradictions in parenting someone who is dependent. I feel an excruciating sorrow over losing her, yet I am at peace. I stay present for her, while at the same time I have let her go. And although my heart is heavy with depression, I feel the lightness of our love for each other. For a time, I struggled to understand my daughter's heroin problem. Finally, I discovered and ultimately accepted the fact that her dependence makes no sense. I made mistakes, but I accept that with my knowledge and awareness at the time, I did the best that I could. For my part, I want to look back at these troubling times and feel at peace with the kind of parent I was. In the meantime, I want to be the kind of parent my dependent daughter needs most right now. What I believe she needs most is a parent who is stable, resilient, and down to earth. She needs a mother to soothe the many bruises on her arms and on her heart. She needs a father to help her focus on her reality. Mine is a still, calm, wise type of parenting that waits for an opportunity to be of real help. In the process, I create the space for my child to seek effective help from other people. This is a gentle parenting that welcomes the spirit to move and transform both of our lives. Soon I may see my daughter completely recover and prosper. But most of all, this is a brand of parenting that sets an example for my daughter and can help her decide in what way she can be a good parent to herself. Now this letter sounds very calm and thoughtful, but we need to be aware that this mother wrote the letter after a long struggle. She had used the 24-7 support line, been to support groups and to Stepping Stones courses. She had really struggled with the idea and experience of letting go. A lot of you will not be at that point, but don't worry, it will happen when you are ready.
We're now going to do a little exercise which may help you to understand what the experience of letting go could feel like. If you take your left hand and put it over your right hand and start to pull those two hands apart, what happens is that you start to feel tension growing in your arms and across your shoulders. So this is a metaphoric example of what letting go could feel like. Your left hand is hanging onto the right hand for dear life. Under no circumstances is that left hand going to let go. Now with your right hand, you're pulling as hard as you can to try and break away. Two opposing forces, one hand hanging on for dear life and the other trying to break away. If you carry on holding your hands like this, the tension will reach into your shoulders and then move across the back of your neck. And eventually, if you continue to hold on, it will take over your whole body. When you reach a point of letting go, you actually stop the struggle of pulling and it's literally as easy as this. If you then let go of those hands, there is a great sense of relief. And this is what letting go can be like when a family starts to build their balance pole and gets to the point of letting go. So letting go means letting go of your judgments, wanting to find solutions, wanting to fix the person using drugs, maybe leading with your own expectations and needing to be in control. But letting go does not mean letting go of your support or your hopes or your love which your family member needs most right now. And now I would like us all to share in the reading of this poem that illustrates what letting go could be for you as a family member. Letting go does not mean to stop caring. It means I can't do it for someone else. Is not to cut off. It's a realization I can't control another. Is not to enable, but to allow learning from natural consequences. Is to admit powerlessness, which means the outcome is not in my hands is not trying to change or blame another, it's to make the most of myself. Is not to care for, but to care about. Is not to fix, but to be supportive. Is not to judge, but to allow another to be a human being. Means I need not be in the middle arranging the outcome, but allows others to affect their own destinies. Is not to be protective, it's to permit another to face reality is not to deny, but to accept. Is not to nag, scold or argue, but instead to search out my own shortcomings and correct them. Is not to adjust everything to my own desires, but to take each day as it comes and cherish myself in it. Is not to criticise or regulate anybody, but to try and become what I dream I can be. Is not to regret the past, but to grow and live for the future. Letting go is to fear less, and to live more. I hope this poem has given you more of a sense of what it feels like to go through the experience of letting go. And this brings our session to an end. So thank you so much for coming along. I would also like to draw your attention to the new online resource, which takes you through the experience of participating in a support group. And thank you so much for coming.